had an administrative presence in and get going. So today I want to further this discussion of testability and, and a particular aspect with testability that's going to dovetail with testing, um, which is going to be a lot of our focus next week. Um, so last time we talked about a number of types of investment that could aid with testability. Can anyone mention some things that help testability? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, crash reports. Crash reports, good, yeah. Others? Yeah. Assertions. Sorry? Assertions. Assertions, uh, big time, yeah. Yeah, they help find the error closer to where it occurred. Um, uh, or, or find evidence of a, of a problem closer to where the, the fault was first introduced. Yeah, and what about the name? James. James. Logging. Logging is another good one. Yes. That's the uh, uh, Kim, uh, Kurtzow. Kurtzow. Yeah. Okay. I'll get it right by the last day. Okay. Uh, what is it? Test hook. Yes. Um, so test hook takes many forms, but basically they make it possible to get information that normal users of the class wouldn't get, um, but which is used for debugging or testing or logging or, or whatever purpose, right? So, so you have sort of privileged access to the sense of, for in order to track down what issues are going on, et cetera. Extra, extra functionality, just like when you build a building, beyond building like the walls and the floors and the roof and the structures, you also have like scaffolding. There's scaffolding that we built when we built that, that business. Um, although it often sticks around. Good. So those are some investments in testability we talked about last time. Um, but there was one that was mentioned that I wanted to return to. Because, in part because there's expectations on you. And so today we're going to go through a bit of an exercise today. And those who are here are have an advantage, although our uh, uh, classmate who's absent for health reasons will also be able to access it. Um, but uh, it's an exercise involving specifications. And so I, I want to talk about this issue and, and the issue of contracts. I think most of this should be pretty familiar from 370, but um, I'm not sure. Possibly some dates back to um, to 270. So software is complex, um, uh, dynamically, structurally, there's many moving parts, lots of interconnections, and, and really it's a major barrier for, for delivery of the software and delivery of value with the software. Um, and so, you know, systems are over budget, over time, et cetera. And um, a key component for addressing the challenge of complexity is modularity. We've talked about it in this group before, and but I just want to get a bit of reminders in place. Why, why do we why do we use modularity uh, within our systems? Why why do we break it up into pieces that are modular that are distinct, often with you know deal with separate areas of functionality, um, mostly independent that have low coupling between them, like no coherence and curling. Why do we do that? Why do we why do we break things up into pieces? Yes, uh James. It makes testing much more easier. Makes testing easier. That's that's exactly right. And that's a key thing we're going to be focused on over the next week. Anyone else? Yes, Riley. Yeah, reuse code. So we can often, you know, place in a certain place a, a a bit of code that's used in many, many places and then call it from many places. Other things? Yes, uh, name again? Dashi. Maybe you have loose coupling? Yeah, you can have loose coupling. Okay, so so it's just cleaner because instead of having a big hairball, you can have these components that mostly just mind their own business. They mostly deal with in things internally and they're much less tangled with other stuff, right? So that's good. How about another very practical reason? Uh, yes, Norman. Also readability. Indeed, readability uh, is enhanced if you're dealing with responsibilities that are clear, like 
this deals with UI uh, issues, or this deals with the data, the data side, uh, et cetera. G. Yeah, because you don't have to change the whole thing. You can often confine that change to one or two things. Okay, that's good. Was there another hand up over here? Yes, and name again? Uh, channel. Channel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it allows more to parse to be uh, in parallel. Yeah, exactly. So you get a multiple people developing in parallel. All, all really good, all really good reasons for for developing things in a modular fashion. So whether it's code creation, as Han Long said, modification, testing, as was said up front, uh, debugging as well, review, right? Uh, staff specialization. You have this person working on the data layer. You have this other person working on, on the front end. This other person working on business logic, what have you. Um, this one in the scripting language. Now, a key need to deliver on modularity effectively is, is abstraction. Um, what, what do we mean by abstraction? If I use the term abstraction, what, what does that mean? Do you want it roughly deep hiding the details? Hiding the details is a big part of it. Um, and uh, it's it's recognizing that certain things are essential and certain details don't effectively matter. You hide them. Because you hide them, other things aren't counting on. So you can evolve, for example. Come back to this. What else is involved with abstraction yeah, right. Creating some kind of generalized interface yeah. and okay. communication. Exactly. It's about generalization, it's about coming up with a more general understanding but one that's less tied to these details. The details are essential. It's it's the essential things that you have. So good. Um it's it's abstracting over certain details, hiding the details, recognizing they don't matter. We can handle a wide variety of circumstances the same way. Right? We have gen enough generality that many particular circumstances we handle the same. Right? We handle things, a whole bunch of different things equally well. Um, so we don't have to do totally different things for the different uses. We can do basically the same thing and pass in different values for, for the particulars. Right? Um, uh, we have sort of the commonality in a general way. And, and it turns out this really allows for flexibility. It allows for Revolution. Now, one thing that's not really talked about in courses explicitly here, and I think it's a gap actually, is there's two routes to abstraction. These are well articulated in, in an earlier generation of books by uh, Barbara Liskov and, and John Kutag, but are, are not featured much in, in courses here. There's two ways of abstraction. The first is what we call abstraction by parameterization. Anyone want to hazard a guess what that's about? Let's say parameterization. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, the care uh, uh, well, hi. <laughs> Sorry. There's different parts of my brain that know and others that don't. Okay. Um, that's true. So we can have them. When we say we parameterize something um, by something, what, what are we talking about? We, uh, G? So, like, yeah, just like answer like what you asked. Like, what okay. I think it's like giving it just enough information to like do what we are expecting. Good. Enough, like to make it spread to see what you want to do. Good. Yeah. yeah. We give it the information it needs to do its job, right? And actually, what Wahaj said is quite right. Like with different overloaded functions, you might have them each responsible for handling a different specific case. One takes two dollars, one takes two hints, or something like that. And they they're parameterized to take the information they need. And there's a couple of different ones, so we can handle different circumstances. But the overall idea is what you said. You know, we're Packaging up all the information we need to do a job to call it. And, and this allows the same code to handle a vast array of circumstances because you just 
you give it this information that it needs to do the job, or you give it this other set of information, this other set, different values for A and B um, that you need to specify the length and the height of the rectangle or something. And you can have rectangles that are small and short or wide and, and tall or whatever, right? Um, any particular circumstance. So you parameter, you have parameters. There's many types of parameters. Height parameters, um, parameters that are essentially tied up with overloading, but uh, but also you know to explain all uh, you know pairs of it or what have you. Now the second type though is this notion of abstraction by specification. And here we're also abstracting. We're we're handling things more carefully. We're hiding details. Um, here we hide details by just saying, I oh, just pass in different values of the argument. Right? We don't hard code assumptions about the arguments of code. We pass in different values for a different. And so the different means, the details are, are just handled by giving it different values. They're, they're not hard code. And so we have multiple uses of that. I'm starting to buy presentation. Here we're hiding implementation details. Basically, any implementation that adheres to the specification is okay. We're hiding the details of what the implementation is as long as it does the same job. As long as it it accomplishes the same thing, we allow it to do it in whatever particular way. So here we're allowing evolution of the implementation. The top one allows different uses, like you can pass the these values, you can pass the those values, and those values. It gives flexibility to do the bottom one gives flexibility of implementation and evolution. What do I say evolution? I say flexibility implementation, flexibility evolution. Why evolution? Yes, we. Maybe because like it grants you more range to do the same thing based on our requirement. We don't specify any specific change in. Right. So it can change as long as it adheres to the goal. So maybe you put in place more efficient algorithm, right? Uh, What's that? Yeah, or you haven't used the GPU or something where it didn't originally, and it still matches the same specification. What it does is the same. It just does it more efficiently now. But because what it does is the same in terms of what people are counting on, they're on effect, right? Because they're counting on the specification. So you know, both of these offer huge values. I mean, the first of them, per by parameterization, is is ubiquitous. It's extremely common. You use it all the time, right? You use different parameters to specify the prediction. You take in two ints, or you take in an array of floats, or you take in a, 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 a hash table entry, or whatever it is, um, a key and a value. Um, so, you know, it'll handle all these different circumstances by passing it different different values. So you can call it from many places. Riley said that, I think. Someone earlier said, look, a big advantage here is reuse for modularity. If we have something that takes different values and as parameters, we can call it from many places with many different values. This place creates the rectangle that's tall and, you know, and, and thin. This one does it with tall and wide, whatever. And we, we use the same code again and again, right? And in more advanced languages, as you, I think, come to realize, there's height parameters. So how many people have taken three points? Okay, uh, did you go on to type parameters in Scala? Like the same code, but it could operate on ints here or separately, it could operate on doubles. Uh, yeah. So they're like, it can operate on different types. It's the same basic code, right? Um, so maybe a, whatever type it is, it creates a list of that thing and it inserts this as the first element of the list or whatever. Um, okay. Um, and in Java, I don't know if this makes sense. I think you saw enough Java to, uh, to know about this. You have generics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, 3, 270? And also 280. 280, okay, not necessarily a 
that's easily done on the Yeah. Okay. Um, why do people see C plus plus here? You've seen C, right? In two fourteen. You've seen it once, and that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 If you have a new operating system program, you may see it again, right? Oh. But maybe they'll use Rob by that. Um, or something, right? Um, okay. Um, so, so look, um, these are types of parameterization as well. Like, same function used with different types, right? The type is a parameter. You don't, you don't like pass it like you pass an int. It's a bit different in that, but it's, it's like the same code can be used by telling it do it with doubles as do it with ints or what have you, right? And to a degree, you have that in in object oriented languages too because of polymorphism. But, um, okay, so so here, you know, look, um, if you have two functions, foo and bar, of course, um, and they both have to do bubble sorts, right? Uh, um, instead of hard coding a bubble sort in foo and hard coding it in bar, what do you do? What's the idea with modularity? You, you do what? Yeah, you create a sort function. Great. And that lowers the risk that, like, you may update it here into a quick sort and you forget to update it here. You have only one implementation of it, right? You abstract. You have you 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 abstract the notion of a sort, you put it in one place, it's modular, the other things use it. Great, great. And a different person, as Shen Long said, a different person could work on this as works on these, right? What's not to like? So, so right. I mean, it's the basic idea. You you break it up into pieces, and by having this sort and um, and you separate this out, and basically that that allows different people to work on them, etc. Good stuff. Okay. Um. So here, we need to somehow capture the specifics. This one sorts one thing, and this one sorts the other thing. So we turn it into a parameter, right? This one passes prices to be sorted. This one passes ages to be sorted, right? But they same use, use the same code. It's a, they can be represented as array of doubles. This takes all the information it needs to do its job, as Jeet said, in prescient fashion, right? Um, indeed. Um, okay, but here's the thing. This is by parameterization. Remember I told you there's two types of abstraction. And I'm, I'm, I just talked there about parameterization. You parameterize this. This one passes this parameter price. This one passes this parameter. And they can both use the same thing. That's abstraction by parameterization. We can reuse this thing by parameterizing it by what to sort, right? If this thing only sorted prices, we could, we'd be really restricted in where we could use it. We could use it here. We couldn't use it here. But it because we pass this in, it can... It can handle both these jobs, right? Sensible thing, fundamental to software engineering. But here's the thing. We're using bubble sort right now. Mm. Now, what this is not dealing with, what, what this type of delegation is not dealing with is this whole issue of brittleness that if we change this to a quick sort, guess what's going to happen? Well, now these ties may not be in the same order, and it may be that basically it breaks some of this code. Um, going from a quick sort, bubble sort to a quick sort will change how ties are handled. Uh, in a quick sort, something that was, excuse me, a bubble sort, something that was up, up front earlier will stay up front. But even if it's tied with other things, they'll be in the order we gave them. But here, um, the, the order uh, within the sort uh, will be preserved for ties. But here with quick sort, it may be different. And that could cause problems actually here. It, it could cause some major problems. So, you know, here, you know, what are, what are we supposed to do? Well, every time we could look at this code, every time it changes and check if it's still works okay we recognize oh we changed to quick sort from bubble sort now we're now we got to change this we got to fix this um 
but it's it's a problem. That's a problem. So the key idea here is specification. This does not have a specification. Why do I say it doesn't have a specification? Why, why do I say, you know, that it has no specification of given? This is a signature, right? It says it takes an array of doubles and returns the point of an integer. Hmm? What, why is that? Why do I say it's lacking a specification? Sorry? Yeah, it doesn't, it also, it doesn't say what it guarantees, what it does, what it ensures, what, what's, what are the guarantees it gives and uh, in, in giving back its result, right? It doesn't say what its job is. Like this is the information it needs to do its job, but what's its job? Like, okay, so it sorts it, but does it sort it retaining ties in the same order as they were originally given? It's not clear. So the idea behind abstraction by specification is to separate the interface from the implementation. I'm sure you must have heard this a lot, right? In other words, you separate the interface from the computer. Why do you do that? Anyone? What's the good reason for this? Why do we separate the interface from the computer? So there are problems in the screen, like when people are off there, they don't think they're good for them. And you may be better to keep them separate and then still group them. So I'm going to say, look. Okay, I didn't, didn't quite get the gist of what you were saying. So do you want to repeat that or? So we keep like the same method that we're going to use from that. Yeah. Um, we can like use that in your business or anything. Yes. That same push down. Okay, yeah. So it'll handle, handle many particular specifics in the implementation of it. Yes, uh, so like we have a Java interface and it will handle many classes that implement that interface. So take a look at the Was there another hand up over here? Yes, well, uh, we would do this for abstraction reasons. The person using your code is not worried about Yeah, they know what's guaranteed, right? Then they know what's insured. Um, and facilitates modularity because it can be. You know, the person evolving it can be different than the person that uses it. And the person who uses it has all the information they need to do their job. They don't have to worry what's going on over in this implementation. They can focus on their implementation. So the details here are hidden, but the, the, dif the, differences, the, the differences between the implementations, any implementation that offers the same interface is considered acceptable, right? Any implementation that adheres to this Java interface, for example, is considered fine as long as it has the same specification, the same guarantees that it offers. Um, so you can change one area of the system without worrying, it's gonna break all the users of it. Because as long as you stick by these guarantees, you can change the implementation, right? You can evolve the implementation to be more efficient. To use a GPU where you didn't previously, or or to use quick sort where you used to use bubble sort, and you know they're not counting on ties being handled in the same order that they were they were given or what have you. Um, and so we can we can end up reusing this the, this this code and and um, uh, basically uh, in this this interface again and again and again. Um, so uh, it turns out it allows interface-based polymorphism, but I'm, I'm not going to go as heavy on that. So um, a key motivator for this is, is risk of change, right? I mean, like, we want to be able to evolve parts of the program without breaking everything else, right? We want to be able to evolve certain areas without worrying that all the uses of it will be at risk of being broken, or that all of them will have to look at the new implementation to figure out if, if they're okay or have to be fixed. In short, it decouples what's going on here, the, the abstraction being used from the many uses of it. You know, this can evolve, these things use it, 
these these things over here um, use it, but the thing being evolved um, can evolve because it knows the users of it um, have all the guarantees are still being met. The implementation of this can go from bubble to principle. It can make use of a more efficient algorithm. It can make use of a new set of linear algebra libraries or whatever it is. Um, uh, if it can make use of without breaking these because it knows it's not changing any of the guarantees. That's that's the idea here. Um, so we're hiding the details of what's going on here, right? Before, with abstraction by parameterization, we handled many circumstances by passing different parameters. We, we hid the details of which particular values in this work were given by just passing, you know, parameters that that included those values. And we don't have to worry in this code about what the particular values. We handle all of them, right? That was parameterization. Now we're handling this abstraction by specification. As long as this contract is the same, as long as it adheres to the contract, the evolution of this shouldn't impact the, the users. Okay, but the key question is, how do we define this contract? How do we define the interface? Just knowing like the signature is, is just grossly insufficient. It doesn't tell you what is guaranteed, right? Um, so um, here we we need some way of having a contract in place, some way of having guarantees specified for what this code does, um, so that we don't have to every time this evolves have these folks go look at it and say, "Did it break it?" We need we need some specification. Now, sometimes this is in English, and sometimes it's in a technical language that makes it really precise. And, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. But we need a contract of sorts. And there's many ways of, of specifying these contracts. In general, we want enough information that it's clear that the users of it can count on certain critical functionality, the essential things that it's doing, what it's doing, but, and, and so they can be clear if it doesn't meet their needs, that like, oh, this doesn't make this key guarantee I need. Um, but it should have, it should be general enough. So we want to provide enough information that users will be clear does it meet their needs or not. But not, not so much detail that it ties us down. For if we're implementing this over here, this code, we want to be able to evolve it. We want to be able to evolve it, and we don't want to make so many promises like that we exactly what we're doing in the sort that we can't change whether we use quick or both, for example. So we want it general enough that it will allow a variety of, of implementation. And it should be clear to understand, too. It should be really clear to someone who reads it. Okay. Um, I'll come back to this point, but this specifications help the users, the users of this, because they worry, don't have to worry their code will break when this evolves. You got that? When this evolves, they know that the guarantees will still be met, that they're counting on, and they don't care how this evolves as long as it meets those guarantees. It also frees these folks. Why does it free these folks? Why is it good for the implementers of this, of this abstract? Why does it help them? Yes, well, they don't have to worry about what code is intended. Yeah, I'm not going to make guarantees. Yeah, they they can with confidence change certain things because they know no one should be counting, right? No one should be counting on exactly how this is handled or that one. Therefore, they can freely change it. They can freely evolve it, um, and and you know that's uh, liberating in a way. So. Um, the creators of the abstraction, um, uh, you know, have have real benefits, and moreover, um, you know, they can they can actually uh, take advantage of benefits here if they know what the if they know what the contract is, they can write tests against it, right? Uh, so so here, this should really say write tests against interface. Before the the um, the implementation is complete, this should say is complete. 
uh, they can they can basically write tests to to ensure that uh, it it will be working properly. Okay, um, and these specifications have huge QA benefits. Why does it help quality assurance? Anyone? What could this help in quality assurance? Writ large, I'm talking testing, but other forms of QA too. What does this help? There's some answers up there. I'm going to switch it and, and ask you. So, why does it help? My specifications, what does it help? I think some of you are testers right now. Those who are not testers probably will be tested soon. Why does it help you? If you have a specification of what the code guarantees, what it say preconditions are, post conditions. Why does that help you? Yeah. Uh, name again? Uh, Henry. Uh, you can do, uh, you can look at the uh, requirements and it's easier to. Uh, uh, to the guy in the black box. Exactly. Yeah, you can test those that meet these requirements. Yeah. Good. Good. Where else can it help? Beyond testing. Yeah, because yeah. we're in, we're in, in parallel with the developer. That's true. Sure. Yeah, the testers could go and start developing tests for it, even though the developers might not have finished their implementation. So that's key. What else can it help? What, where can this be really useful? What sort of meeting? Could this be really useful to have access to specification? If your team is doing a I'm going to peer review an inspection of the code, wouldn't it be really useful to have access to those specifications so you know what this code is, you know what it's supposed to do, and then you look at how? It's supposedly doing it, and you can check. Do they have that? Right. Um, it can, moreover, help for sure the the folks who are trying to trying to make sure that the code that uses it is correct. So the peer review of code that uses that specification. So not a peer review of the thing being implemented, but a peer review of the things using it. You know. Is it at risk of passing it, uh, you know, uh, uh, a null null reference, et cetera, right? So um, it can moreover help for assertion checks, right? Alan said it earlier, actually, with some of the benefits associated with, uh, with, with custom form, one of the things that offers flexibility is assertion. Why can specification help assertion? Why does the presence of the specification like help help me write a certain? Yes, Pete. Yeah, yeah, you know, like in the thing that's being implemented, I know what the preconditions are supposed to be, so I can make sure they're being met. I know what the post conditions are supposed to be, I can make sure they're being met. In places which use it, I can ensure that what I get back is. It adheres to its guarantees, right? Uh, so there's lots of things I can check there. Those are like freebies for for assertions, right? If you write specifications, you've got a bunch of assertions given to you right away, right? Like they're handed to you. You can write a bunch of assertions. It's awesome. Uh, as Bahar said, it's easier to test trace by case creation before. And mocking is much easier. Why do I say mocking is easier? Because when you create mocks, one of the first things that you want those mocks to do, mocks are not merely stuff that return to you know fixed values. They often serve to check are the things being passed to me legitimate, right? And look, if you have the specification, you know at least what sort of thing is supposed to be returned, and so you can have the mock return something reasonable. But in the specifications, you may see this thing. This thing should only be called once in the entire project, for example. You call one time. And you can check in a mock. Was it called more than once in this in this run of the program? If so, put in assertion violation, for example. Um, so it'll help you with, with mock, right? Check and call to mock, make sure the preconditions are being um being satisfied, et cetera. 
We'll come back to the Liskov substitution principle in a later in a later uh, set of lectures. Have you have you folks talked about the Liskov substitution principle and safe sub subtyping and safe subclassing? You saw that some in what three seventy? Okay, good. Okay, um, so look, they they help in a lot of areas. They they help with documentation. They help um, they help in 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 integration of different pieces of code, easier understanding of the code, conceptual clarity. They help in some cases with more aggressive optimization because you know what should be what should be guaranteed. Um, and look, this helps development speed, testing speed and depth, debugging. Why do I say it helps debugging? Why do I say it helps debugging? Among other things you can find First of all, you, you can know, okay, this thing I'm getting back should adhere to this. And is it? And you can test it, right? If it's not, it's probably a sign that that's not doing its job. And you can start to finger that as the, pro as the problem. Jeet, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. And look, if you're clear about what behavior is guaranteed, you can actually start to optimize somewhere. Sometimes, because you know, this thing can never be a duplicate of this other one. Or these two can never be equal, for example, and that can allow optimizations. So what am I looking for for your code? I'm looking for a simple thing. Preconditions and post-conditions is what I'd like to see. Now, I'm not gonna force this for every bit of code, you but I'd like to see them a lot because they give for free opportunities for assertion, right? I mean, it, it, I know it's a pain to write preconditions and post conditions, but it helps you think about it, and it helps create tests very quickly, early, before the code is written, and it helps in writing assertions. And generally, it will speed things up. You know, the main thing to talk development, the costs are obvious that the benefits are not. There are certain areas of life this is good. We, we pay attention to the cost and the benefits are left clear. Whole classes of beings in this world whose life revolves around being counting the cost. And they often don't see the benefits because the benefits are broader and harder to total up. It's harder to, to total up. This is one of the reasons we do modeling, Tony, is to be able to total up the benefits, which otherwise are not so clear. Whereas the costs are often clear. And and so preconditions, post conditions, I really want to see these for your code if you if you can do that. And often they're pretty easy to find. I'm not going to police every bit, but see if you can do it. Now, beyond that, we're going to be talking about in these later lectures, which is about the list of substitution principles and various ethics and problems. Did you talk about those in 370? With the with the Liskov substitution principle, I don't think you're right. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about those in the later lecture. But if you can do preconditions and post conditions, I'll be one happy camper. Um, okay, so you're here in class, and we have our oh my god, okay, okay, um, so I have three problems. I want you to try to create. For each of these, it says in rough terms what it does. This thing takes two strings and it finds the index of the string you found in the string in the first string. Okay? But finding where it is, the index, you can count it zero from one. I, I don't care that much. Either one. Maybe say zero if, if you want to pay attention. I'm not going to care that much. So that's the first. The second one here, ladies and gentlemen, is going to count the number of times that the string being found occurs in, in, the, in this other string, I guess. So this first one says, uh, it says find the index. Notice I, I left that ambiguous, which index. Um, you, you can make a decision. This one finds the common occurrences. This one, this one extracts the substring from this string here 
that starts at zip index and ends at that index. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do is to try to create a plausible specification for each of these models. Okay. And I have a piece of paper. You can write it down. Now, I'm going to allow group work for this. Just write down all your names. Okay. So if you want to do it in groups of up to three, I'm fine with that. Just write it down. Who, who contributes to this? Okay. Um, you can cooperate. Uh, but I want you to try to write down the three conditions of closeness and some clear English. You know, what would be a plausible special case? I haven't told you all the details, but I'm, I'm going to allow you flexibility in what you want to assume. If you want to say the strings have to be, as part of three conditions, have to be non null, fine. That's, that's fine. That's fine. If you want to say indices are counted from one, I'm not going to fine. Okay? So I'm going to hand these out, and then we're going to go over them. Okay? So. There you go. And these will also reward you as for coming to class. Oh, appreciate that. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um and uh Daniel, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna send it to you the moment here. It's actually on the it's on the point there's a content for a lot of Okay, so Daniel, um, I'm going to temporarily stop the. So we got a question that, um, with respect to putting down the specifications, I suggested preconditions and post conditions are good starting points. And someone had asked, you know, should it have a different clause for what it returns than from post conditions? So what I said is, sometimes post conditions are used to summarize what changes what side affected what what is modified you know in in some persistent way and 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 then the return value is used for what it actually returns but sometimes you can treat in post conditions you can say well what it modifies and what it returns and just break those out of sub clauses of post condition i'm not too particular about that I, Say if it's simpler for you, you can have a separate returns from post conditions, but you could also keep them together. I, I will say that these ones are all functional, so they you know, kind of lead to a, you know output of something or sending a message or changing changing the state or displaying something. There's no real side effects occurring here, so. It, could also be put in post condition, uh, the return value. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Now. Start this up. Okay, so uh, for the first of them, um, find first. Anyone want to characterize what they thought a kind of good, uh, good specification would look like? What would be some key components? Let's say the precondition. What what would some preconditions, uh, uh, possibly? Uh, be there that might be good to to characterize anyone? Yes. Uh, so, Manette. Um, you said that the 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, not null or or and and yeah, not not empty to the degree. Okay, so you want to rule out that they are that they are of zero length, right? You want to rule out um, them them being zero length. What would be the matter if if uh, it were zero length for the string being found? What what would be the problem with that? So it's not really well defined, right? <laughs> like. Like to say, I'm going to look for a string of length zero in this in this string. I'm going to look for empty string in cat. That, that, that's going to be not well defined, right? Um, okay, so I mean, you could argue well, just say it occurs at zero, but it's you know an index zero, but it's it's not really that well defined what what that would be. Um, okay. Uh, Anyone else? Uh, so, how about you say the string to find it in is a zero length, but the other one's not? Is that okay? So, I'm looking for look for a and an empty string. With what? What do you think should be returned there? Sorry. So, so an F's definition would rule that out, right? Yeah. And does anyone disagree? Yes, uh, Mark. Oh, I just had a precondition to that. Okay. Our, our list of string being found in yeah. is longer than the string was equal to. Okay. Or you can. Or equal to. Yeah, yeah. I can look for a cat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so there you actually had one kind of depend on the length, if it was bounded by the length of the other. And I, and I think that makes sense too. You're not looking for a cat in in A, right? Um, although you could argue, what's the matter? Like that's not still defined to look for a cat in just A. It just doesn't find it, right? Um, but it's not well defined to look for blank in A or a cat. Um, I think it's arguable whether it's you know if you look for a and something that's empty, uh, but it it, it it basically there there you would have to indicate it's not found right, um, and and somehow you have to indicate something about the case where it's not found in any case right. So how did you handle so for the uh, return value? How did you handle that? Um, so what's the return value when it's not found? Anyone? Yes, Marvin. Minus one. Okay. Um, good. Uh, anyone else handle that? Um, the case where it's not found differently? Okay, but here it does return an inch, right? So so it, it, it returns an inch, but um, yeah, I mean, if, if it returns something different, it could be not found. Okay. Uh, so that's good. Um, so um, I had, you know, uh, that both are non-null and the one being found has to have a length greater than zero, but I did allow the other one to be of zero length, in which case, you know, it's just not going to find it. But I said return the minimum index of sure find it such, such uh, that um, uh, that the substring starts uh, starts there, and if it's minus one, it, if it doesn't start anywhere. I return to minimum index that extracts substring of it um, equals to even frown. So you can actually specify it in terms of another function. Like it returns an index such that if I extract the substring starting at that index and going for the certain length of the string being found, it's equal to the string being found. Um, and minus one if there's no such index. And the first such index is we, we indicate is zero. Okay, how about the second one? We, we may start some of this uh, next time, but yeah, count substring. So, so uh huh. Just before you jump into the second one, sure. For the first condition for the first one, yep. do you think it's valid if you return, for example, minus two, if we pass an integer? Like that function will check the type of the parameter. 
and if we move past something that is not a string, we return to the point of saying that. You could. I mean, in this case, my intent was to require it to be a string, but you're right. If if that wasn't specified, yes, you could. It would be good to indicate a different one, right? Like that that it's not handled with with strings now. So yeah, you could do that. It would, it would make sense actually. Um, yeah. So so this is what I had, and I'll you know provided provided to you. You know, pretty good. It's not null, not null, and the printing sum uh, length is greater than zero. I did at least uh, specify the string. That was my intention. And, but I agree completely with if that's not, if you feel that's not guaranteed based on the specification, you need to say something about it. The return to minimum in that size, but that um, substring, uh, okay, there's, there's some type of here, but um, in other words, return to the minimum index i such that extract substring. There returns for be found or minus one if there's no such index. The first such index is zero. So we're indicating like we're counting the indices from zero. Okay, how about the the next uh, the next one? And uh, uh, Daniel had his hand up here, so um, so yeah, Daniel. Uh, we're gonna have to get out of here uh, and and continue next time. Uh, but Daniel, uh, when writing specifications, and uh, can you use plain English? Um, no, you can use plain English. It's just sometimes pseudocode is clearer, particularly if if you if you're using referring to other functions like I did. I said extract substring at that place would return such and such. That's often really handy, and we'll see that quite a bit in some later some later ones, and often. It's handy to specify using a bit of code with like logical operators. This is true, and that's true, and that's true. It's just uh, convenient to use to use code. Okay, we're going to continue to look at this a bit next time. Um, I may post them, but next time we're going to be going over some function, some testing exercise. Okay. Again, so I'll ask you to watch the video, and we'll work on that. Thank you.